Ladies and gentlemen, fellow travelers on the road to a climate resilient future, I'm glad you could make it to this online webinar. Today is an important milestone on our journey to the International Climate Adaptation Summit on the 25th of January 2021. That day, global leaders will launch a comprehensive global adaptation action agenda, setting out concrete new endeavors and partnerships to make our world more resilient to the effects of climate change by 2030. There's no time to waste. Every minute, as I'm speaking to you now, almost one million tons of ice melts in Greenland and Antarctica. The COVID-19 crisis shows how vulnerable we are, how unprepared we are to respond effectively when a pandemic catches us by surprise. But climate change is no surprise. The effects are apparent here and now. Droughts, floods, heavy storms, rising temperatures and a rising sea level. We're in trouble now, so we need to adapt now. Let's share knowledge and expertise on this. Let's join forces around the world to accelerate adaptation action on a much larger scale than ever before. I won't stop repeating this call to action. Our country, the Netherlands, has made a name for itself through centuries of water management and adaptation. So today we're showcasing some examples of Dutch innovations. Nine interactive webinars focusing on Dutch adaptation approach and how we can share this knowledge with the rest of the world. What's needed to embed nature-based solutions into planning and policy for large-scale implementation globally? Wageningen University and Research, one of our frontrunners in applied science, presents and discusses the latest insights. My personal goal is to help scale up global efforts in adapting to the inevitable effects of climate change. I'm happy you're joining me in this venture. I wish you all a constructive and inspiring day. Good morning. Thank you, Minister van Nievenhuizen. Um, Welcome to our session, uh, Finding Nature-Based Solutions Together. My name is Rainier Hilleris Lambers. Um, I'm a program leader, biodiverse environment at Wageningen University and research. So why nature-based solutions? So our society is faced with the challenges of both biodiversity loss and climate change. And we hope to highlight how climate action can go hand in hand with biodiversity uh, to highlight the potential of nature-based solutions and specifically, to look forwards to what is needed to accelerate them. So, um, today we hope to highlight some elements in what is needed towards transitioning towards a biodiversity inclusive and a climate resilient society. So one, we hope to present stories of hope, not necessarily of doom, and we look forward to a vision of how the Netherlands can be in 2120. We also, what else is needed? We also need evidence-based solutions and so we will look towards coastal areas, food systems, and urban areas. Third, transitions require partnerships between research, government, civil society, and business. And so we are very happy to also welcome a panel representing international conservation organization, uh, sustainable investors, and the city of Amsterdam uh, to look at nature-based solutions through their eyes. Um, and also, we invite your questions. Um, we'll have space for your questions both during the presentations, actually after the presentation. So we'll be monitoring the chat function. Um, please, please do ask questions to our panel. So a few more things about uh, housekeeping. So please remember your chat questions. Um, we'll share a resources page with you afterwards with some more information on how to contact us and some interesting uh, links. And also, um, behind me, there is a hashtag. I'll try to please follow that. Adaptation Summit. I can't get in the way. I can't show it completely, but I think you know how to spell it. So there you go. Um, thank you very much. Um, and onwards to our program. We will start with our first uh, researcher, um, Tim van Hattem. Welcome, Tim. Thanks. You are, uh, ah, there you are. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so you're, you're a program leader, Green Climate Solutions at uh, Wageningen University. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so what does your work entail? What are you trying to achieve? Well, we are trying to create evidence-based for nature-based solutions because we believe that that can be a very important solution for um, well, the challenge we are facing for climate yeah. mitigation and adaptation. Great. Well, I'm really looking forward to your talk. That's a nature-based vision for the Netherlands in 2120. Take it away, Tim. Thanks. Yeah, I would like to um, uh, take you to the future, uh, take you to uh, the Netherlands uh, after 100 years and see how a, a nature-based future of the Netherlands can look like. But let me start with today. Um, the year 2020 was supposed to be the year of nature-based solutions, but it turned out to that we are facing another challenge at this moment. Of course, we are facing this COVID challenge and we have a financial crisis coming after that. Um, but we all know that the next um, years we face another challenge, and that is climate change. And we are already experiencing the impact of climate change all over the world. Uh, in the Netherlands, we had three very dry years in a row. Uh, we ex are experiencing f uh, floods, uh, wildfires, um, heat waves. And climate change will increase the impact uh, of these kind of events. So we really need to act. Um, and when this cartoonist made this beautiful cartoon, uh, there was a lot of discussion on the internet uh, because people said there's something missing on this picture. And that's, uh, that's biodiversity because we are facing this climate challenge, but we are also facing a very big loss of biodiversity. And I think these are the challenges of the 21st century we have to face and we have to, uh, we have to act. And if you ask people, um, how do you think the Netherlands will look like in the future? Um, there are many people that really think that the Netherlands uh, will look like this, will, will uh, be, be flooded in the future. And people are becoming scared. And, well, climate and biodiversity are the biggest challenges of the 21st century, and we know exactly what we have to do. We have to reduce emissions towards zero in 20, 2050. Uh, we have to adapt to a one and a half or two degree warmer world. And we have to increase biodiversity. And we, we need an integrated approach. And for this, I think nature-based solutions are a big part of the solution. Protecting and restoring nature is what we call nature-based solutions. And nature is very good at, uh, at something that it has been doing for millions of years. Rest uh, collecting and uh, storing carbon and create resilience for the impact of extreme weather events. So nature-based solutions can be a very important part of the solution. And with a group of researchers, we tried to create a storyline of how the Netherlands could look like in the future when we apply these nature-based solutions, facing all the challenges our country is, is, is facing at this moment. We have the energy transition, we have to move towards a circular economy, we have to mo move towards a circular and plant-based food system, and we have uh, a lot of housing, we still have to, to build houses. So we created um, guiding principles to create a new storyline for the Netherlands, uh, where nature, um, our natural system, our soils, our water systems are the starting point for creating and redesigning the Netherlands, uh, where water plays a central role, where the circular and climate positive economy plays an uh, uh, important role. And where a country that is adaptive to the impact of, uh, of, of, of climate change and a nature-inclusive society. And we decided we can create a report or we can create scenario studies, but we, we thought, okay, now let's put nature-based solutions and the nature-based future of the Netherlands on the map. And this is the map. This is the new map of the Netherlands, how the Netherlands could look like in 100 years when we apply these nature-based solutions on a massive scale. And what we did is we turned the map to show, to give another perspective of, of our country, but also to show that the sea is also a large part of the solution. And I know we all cannot travel at this moment, so uh, let's 
let's zoom into the map a little bit and let's take you on a journey into the future of the Netherlands. And let's start at sea. We can produce lots of renewable energy at sea. Wind energy, hydrogen, even solar, floating solar energy. And we can pro also produce a lot of food, oysters, mussels, and seaweed. And if we then further zoom into our country, we see a lot of rivers, of course. Our country exists of a lot of rivers, and we will start to give these rivers much more space to flow, to prevent floods, but also to create lifelines in our landscape. And if we then further zoom in, we see a lot of restored wetlands. Wetlands are very good at storing carbon, but also protecting us from flooding and enhancing biodiversity. So, wetlands restoration is a part of the solution. And, of course, large parts of our country is agricultural land, but our agricultural system, our, our food system, is, is going through a transition. We have to move towards a plant-based food system and a circular food system. So we will use the best soils to produce plant-based food. And we have to make our food system climate resilient because we have to cope with droughts and flooding. So we come up with all kinds of drought resistant crops. And if you then further zoom in in, in the places where, where uh, that are not the best places for agriculture, there we will provide a lot of trees because the best way to absorb carbon from the atmosphere is uh, photosynthesis. And Trees are very good at that. So we will have much more trees in our country in the future. And if we then use these trees um, for start building with wood, we can build our cities with, um, uh, with wood and store carbon in our buildings. But we can also provide a lot of green in our cities to make our cities much more livable, but also to create cities as sponges and to prevent floods and cool our cities down. This is how we see the future and this is how a nature-based future can look like. And when we published this story, we created a lot of attention. It, uh, it, it was in the media, um, on TV, in the newspapers, and a lot of people were talking about this because this was a narrative of hope. And nature-based solutions can help us to provide um, and, and prevent us from the impact we are facing and loss of biodiversity and climate. But it can also create a better future for our country. So people need this this narrative of hope and, and they are really want to have uh, a future perspective. This is what we learned and this is not only a story for the Netherlands. We can create a story like this for every country and every continent in the world. So let's start doing that and let's start talking about nature-based solutions and how to implement them on a huge scale all over the world. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tim. That was a very inspiring presentation. Um, I, I'm looking forward to see if there's any uh, questions from the uh, audience. I'm sure you must have questions. Uh, for example, how, uh, uh, how do you do this? Uh, uh, maybe questions on reactions in the media. Um, please come with your questions. Uh, uh, Tim, uh, uh, so, so, uh, um, Maybe for you, how do you see this perspective for the Netherlands scaling towards uh, other countries? Uh, is, there a, is there a possibility, do you think? Absolutely. I think, um, like we showed, is that nature-based solutions is not only a solution for climate. It has so much other benefits that um, uh, yeah, it, it really creates a, a very a much more livable uh, society. Yeah. And we can create a story like this uh, for, for other continents, for other countries, and, and uh, do the same exercise together with um, people and resources from all over the world. Great, yeah. yeah. Still waiting for questions. Please come with your questions. This is, uh, Tim is here now and uh, uh, happy to answer them. Um, so yeah, I, let's see. Uh, so what reactions have you received? Tell me a bit more about that. 
Well, it was very, actually from all kinds of sectors, we received very positive reactions that, that people really are uh, in need. There's so much bad news about the climate challenge we are facing. And um, people are so happy with it, with a story that shows what solutions we can take and how the country will look like when we have, have done this. And, and well, a, a hopeful message that we don't have to be flooded in the future, but our country can become a green and attractive country to live in. Ah, so good. Well, yep. speaking of flooding, I think the questions are starting to flood in. <laughs> so that's good. Uh, this is good flooding. Um, so the first question I have is where to start? What do we do tomorrow? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question because um, I, I think this is a very, uh, very good step uh, to, to, to show how a nature-based future can look like. But um, of course, 100 years ahead is, is very far ahead and we have to act today. So every action we take today, if we start building houses or roads or um, uh, um, improving our agricultural system, we have to think of how to um, cooperate with the natural system, how to cooperate with nature instead of, so, so we have to start working with nature instead of against it. And I think in all the policy um, documents we have, we, we should uh, introduce this kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. So another interesting question coming in now, and there's a few, so my apologies if we don't get to every one of them, so, but, but please do keep sending them. Um, is how is people's behavior included in your program? Or maybe in the map, I'm not sure. Uh, people's behavior is very important because uh, every action we take every day, if you go to the supermarket and we buy stuff, uh, we, we, we have impact on, uh, on the world. So um, that is very, uh, that's a, a very important topic. Uh, we are working on that because, uh, and I think a story like this can help to um, make people aware that nature is something that is may maybe our most valuable solution we have. So we have to um, yeah, start telling people that. And by showing it in a picture like this and on a map and uh, that it received, um, uh, it was in all the newspapers, I think that, that's, well, that's spreading the news very fast. Yeah. So I think that's important. Indeed, yeah. the, the right type of viral. Yeah. Uh. So, um, I think we're uh, nearing the end of uh, uh, question time. There's uh, lots uh, flooding in. Maybe just a quick one. I'm sorry, for, once again, if we can't get to all the questions, but you can contact us later. Um, what are the main barriers for realization of this new perspective? Is that a good short question? The, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 the short answer, answer is that we focus a lot on technical solutions. And right. technical solutions are really, really important. We need all of them. We need uh, solar energy. We need all these technical solutions as well. But I think nature-based solutions receive much less attention. And we need to put nature-based solutions on the map. What a beautiful way to uh, 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 conclude. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, I have to remind you to go that way, I think. Thanks. So, uh, <laughs> good. <I'll laughs> Welcome. So, uh, while I clean up the next, the stand, this is my uh, task as moderator as well, um, I'd also like to welcome Dr. Martin Baptiste. Welcome, Martin. Hello, yeah, thank you. I hope I've cleaned it uh, well enough for you, and I've also, right. excuse me, I need to put these down because they don't look that nice. Um, so, um, you're a coastal ecologist. Yes. Um, what does your work entail, actually? What do you do? Oh, uh, well, I'm, a, I'm an ecologist. Yeah, I'm a Wageningen ecologist, uh, but I, I have a PhD in hydraulic engineering at Delft. So actually, I am harmonizing the uh, human uses and, and human engineering with uh, natural systems. Great. And you're going to tell us some more about coastal protection and nature-based solutions. Yes, sure. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Martin. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, I would like to, uh, to give um, a display of, uh, of seven projects that, uh, that we have been working on uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands and abroad. Um, seven projects in which Wageningen University was involved. And the majority of them uh, were actually uh, in the EcoShape Building with Nature uh, program. So uh, I would uh, thank them for that as well. Um, well, first, uh, to give a, a topographic and a, and a thematic overview. 
I will present five cases uh, in uh, the Netherlands and, uh, and, and two uh, international. If you look at the Netherlands, we have a sandy and wave-dominated uh, North Sea coast, and we have a muddy and tide-dominated uh, Wadden Sea uh, coast. So I will present two examples in the sandy and wave-dominated uh, uh, realm, the sand motor and the Hans Bosse uh, sea defense. I will present the Prince Hendrik sea defense, which is literally in the middle. It is between the sandy wave-dominated and muddy tide-dominated conditions. And then I will go to two muddy examples uh, in the north of the Netherlands at the Wadden Sea. And actually, we will continue in the mud in Bangladesh and, uh, and Indonesia. So the first example is a very well-known example of a nature-based uh, solution, uh, the sand motor in The Hague, where the idea is uh, of letting wind, waves and flows move sand in a natural tempo. So what we have done in, in this pilot experiment in the Netherlands is that we, uh, we have uh, placed a mega-nourishment of 21.5 million cubic meters shaped as a beach hook uh, at the beach, and then the wind and the waves and the tides are allowed to gradually erode this huge uh, pile of sand to strengthen the coast and to strengthen uh, nature as well. Now, this pilot project served as a study object for scientific research, uh, which is really important because we need to learn from nature-based examples. We need to find an evidence-based uh, portfolio. Uh, and the sand motor actually became a very uh, big uh, tourist uh, attraction. Um, just uh, last week, uh, Wageningen University uh, finished a study into the uh, appreciation of the sand motor for tourists, and it is uh, it, it's highly appreciated. The second example is the Hans Bosse uh, sea defense uh, in, uh, in Petten. And this is an example of softening the coast and, and adding to recreation and biodiversity. So the problem here that needed a nature-based solution, uh, the problem was that we had a five and a half kilometer long seawall, which was unsafe and unnatural, uh, well, really unnatural compared to the dune system that you see uh, on the left of this, uh, of this first picture. Oh, you don't see. <laughs> um, and uh, so what we did is we placed sand and marram grass in front of the seawall. Well, that is a really uh, nature-based solution uh, and a prime example, uh, because this is nature and this is defending our coast. It has been defending our coast for centuries already. So with uh, 37 million cubic meters of sand uh, that were applied to form a dune landscape. Uh, and we, again, we are learning from this, uh, studying the, um, the ecological and the morphological developments of this huge project. Well, in a very uh, similar way, uh, we were having the Prince Hendrik sea defense uh, on the island of Texel. Maybe less well known, um, but this is also about softening the coast and adding to recreation and biodiversity. And it was completed right after the Prince Hendrik uh, sea defense um, in a similar manner. Here, here we also ha were having a three kilometer asphalt covered levee, which was unsafe, eh, which was not up to the uh, water safety standards. And here also a sandy dune sea defense was built in front of the levee, actually making the complete levee redundant. It doesn't have any function for water safety anymore. The dune is now the natural protection against storms. And actually as an add-on, uh, intertidal habitats were added to this whole uh, dune system to improve biodiversity. And uh, by now it has uh, it is completed with 5 million cubic meters of sand, and actually there is a very uh, rich wildlife in, in birds and uh, uh, in, in this uh, intertidal environment. So that is really working, providing safety and biodiversity. So then we go to the muddy environments, and we have here the mud motor in, uh, in Harlingen. Uh, this is a, a case study of testing the beneficial reuse of mud for coastal protection. So in Harlingen, uh, fine sediment is dredged from the port, and actually uh, a large amount, uh, 1.3 million cubic meters per, per year. And what we have been doing here is to dispose this mud in a shallow tidal channel that is feeding to a salt marsh, uh, with the idea that the additional amount of mud, the volume of mud that you supply, will help growing the salt marsh. And why are we doing that? Well, because salt marshes help in coastal defense and they form a wave-breaking buffer in front of our dikes. 
and they adapt to, to sea level rise. It's, it's wonderful. Nature is growing along with the sea level rise because then the mud is uh, sedimented, sedimentated on top of it. Actually, moreover, uh, salt marshes also store uh, large amounts of, uh, of blue carbon. Uh, so that's also a, a way of climate mitigation. As a fifth example in the Netherlands, we go to a salt marsh construction project in Delfzijl, uh, the Marconi project. And this is a learning by doing uh, approach in a large scale field experiment. Uh, here are, we are testing the grand scale on, uh, on, a, on a real life project. We uh, first actually had to heighten the bed to a salt marsh level and then we placed uh, semi-permeable uh, wooden dams uh, that, that break the waves and that trap and that hold the, the sediment. Uh, actually, this is a technique that has been used in the Netherlands for, well, for over a hundred years and, uh, and it works really, really fine. That was not new, but what we did as a new element was that we put mud sand mixtures of 5, 20 or 50 percent mud in large uh, uh, experimental plots uh, to really see uh, what is the best uh, starting condition if you build, if you construct a salt marsh, what works best, and, and also practical knowledge, how do you apply it, uh, how does it work in practice. And moreover, we also uh, made huge experimental plots where we seeded the salt marsh, uh, marsh with pioneer plants uh, to, to test uh, in how far you can speed up the, uh, the development of the salt marsh. And this is an ongoing work and is giving really interesting uh, results. Okay, then we go abroad. Um, we go to a, a project uh, Wageningen has been cooperating in, uh, in, in EcoShape and together with Wetlands International. This one happens to be on the RTL news of yesterday evening. It's the uh, mangrove restoration uh, project in Demak in Indonesia. And this is a nature-based example of providing coastal safety for nature and food. Uh, and interesting is that we apply to the same semi-permeable uh, wooden traps, uh, that uh, uh, dams, sorry, <laughs> wooden dams that trap and hold uh, the, the sediment, uh, the, the, uh, the century-old Dutch technique. Uh, but, and here they work in the same manner. Uh, the, there's siltation behind the dams, the bed height is, uh, is growing, and then mangrove can start growing in this heightened and sheltered environment. And that is buffering the, the coast and the breaking the waves. But moreover, actually also typical Wageningen input eh, is that the new mangrove belt is then combined with sustainable aquaculture. And so we are also working into that to put this, this into the equation of nature-based uh, solutions um, to give it added value. And, and we're also monitoring the uh, fish uh, populations in, in the mangrove uh, forest, which, uh, which also show an increase in, uh, in population size and in, in diversity. And then as a, a final and last example, um, actually, this is also an example of providing coastal safety for nature and, and food. And I put this here because this is a really small scale example. Uh, we have seen grand projects with, with many hectares of, of pilot experiments and millions of cubic meters of sand, but you have to start small. Eh? And here we started small in Bangladesh by putting uh, 70 centimeter high uh, concrete uh, structures as a uh, as an oyster uh, substrate, uh, with the idea that oyster, shell, uh, oyster larvae could, could settle. And uh, indeed, uh, soon these structures were overgrown by, uh, by oyster spats, and then gradually they are uh, working into a living natural reef. Uh, um, it, it also gave uh, a nice example, harvestable uh, crab for, for the locals, because these crab, they were trapped uh, inside these uh, concrete blocks that, that were hollow. So, uh, Small-scale experiment, but also trying to, to understand your system and provide added value for, for, uh, for multiple purposes. So, these were uh, real-life projects. I mean, they were in the nature, uh, working with people, uh, working with the processes. So, we have some general lessons learned from these projects. Eh? And one is that understanding this natural system is key in designing a nature-based solution. So. Yeah, involve environmental sciences. Uh, that is really important in, in making a, a, a design that works. And uh, well, as a matter of fact, Wageningen University is second best in the world in environmental sciences and ecology, so maybe you can uh, involve us. Um, yet, uh, prepare to be surprised by nature's uh, complexity. Uh, we have seen really nice surprises. Uh, it's, it, it is uh, sometimes beyond your fantasy. 
Um, and second, understanding the governance system is key in realizing nature-based uh, solutions. Uh, so involve social sciences as well. It is really important to look at all your governance systems and, and your people, and yet be surprised by the governance complexity because that is really uh, uh, surprising as well. So with that, I would like to, uh, to end this uh, presentation. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Martin. Uh, very, uh, uh, very interesting. I really enjoyed that. I'm, and first of all, let me just say, uh, uh, please send your questions in the chat. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll monitor them, and uh, uh, we can ask Martin about uh, what, whatever you want uh, within limits. But, uh, so, Martin, uh, maybe just to start, you, you were talking about surprises in nature-based <laughs> yeah, solutions. Yes. So, surprise me, what did you find? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... Uh, well, a couple of years ago, the, the, the sand motor is already an, uh, an example of which uh, the, the sand motor has this lagoonal system, uh, which is uh, filled and emptied by the tides uh, through, a, through a tidal channel. And the tidal channel that is meandering, and actually yeah, that is meandering in, in, in unpredictable ways. Uh, and, and here in the sand motor, it was the erosion of th threatening a beach restaurant. Um, so that was really a surprise. And, uh, and, and what to do, eh? that, that, was, that was nice. And actually, it, it led to a, a, a governmental surprise uh, as well, uh, because then one of the stakeholders decided to, um, to block this uh, meandering tidal channel with, uh, with rocks eh? to, to stop the flow, which, of course, was not the idea of other stakeholders. Eh? So this natural surprise was leading to a governmental surprise. Yeah, that's... Uh, Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, okay, so the, the questions are coming in. Um, so the first one, um, what do you think are the main factors uh, preventing nature-based solutions uh, implemented in other countries? So main factors preventing nature-based solutions. Other yeah, in, in other countries than the Netherlands, yeah. Um, well, I think uh, we can take the Netherlands as, a, as an example in which we have a unique uh, polder uh, model, eh, as we call it, but, but here we have a real, really unique combination of private sector, eh, the, the dredging industry, working with the governmental sector, working with, uh, with, with science as well. And those three are not working really fine uh, in, in, in international uh, examples. I mean, uh, uh, other countries are really uh, surprised, <laughs> again, to, to see how we cooperate and how we make it work and how we find this, uh, this uh, uh, overcome these barriers. Yeah. Great. <laughs> well, a lot more. Um, <laughs> I like this one. Uh, for long-term protection of muddy coasts, is there enough mud available? Haha, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, excellent question. Um, uh, well, usually, yes, yes, there is a lot of mud in uh, in, in in coastal areas, and uh, and it's also uh, actually well, it's a bit technical, but the um, uh, sand is, is 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 there's a shortage of sand, but mud is actually always reused, uh, resuspended, and placed uh, uh, somewhere else. And so these muddy coasts, they have a lot of mud. And, and well, as a matter of fact, for the mud motor, uh, we also we found out that. Um, and we were placing these additional volumes of mud in the mud motor, but that was not the limiting factor. Uh, actually, the limiting factor of salt marsh extension, uh, which was the, uh, the goal here, was that there were no viable seeds uh, of salt marsh plants in front of this salt marsh. So there were no germinating seeds, there was no vegetation, and without the vegetation you don't have a salt marsh. So it was not the mud, there was plenty of mud, but it was in the biology, that was the, uh, the problem. <laughs> Great. So, so uh, maybe just a last question. Uh, who are the main financiers of this type of projects? Yeah, well, here the, in the Netherlands, the main financiers were, again, this cooperation between the private industry, which was uh, heavily uh, involved and also uh, uh, putting money uh, in it, but actually also the scientific sector, because everyone that is participating in the EcoShape Consortium is co-financing uh, the projects. Eh? And of course, the, the national government was uh, co-financing, and we were finding other sub subsidiaries, uh, uh, the Wadden Funds, uh, et cetera. And that is really uh, always a big hassle, to get all these parties together and to, to find this finance uh, structure. That's, that's difficult. OK. Thank you very much, Martin. Yes, uh, you're uh, welcome. Very, very much appreciate it. And uh, I think you have to walk off to that. Uh, no, uh, I go that Oh, you go that way. So yeah. My apologies. <laughs> Okay. Some confusion, but we'll work it out. Um, so for our next uh, speaker, uh, please, uh, we have Annemarie Groot. Uh, I, I have to ask you to wait while I uh, uh, sanitize your... Uh, Thank you. There you go. So um, 
Anna-Marie, welcome. You are a, a researcher, climate change adaptation in food systems. So what does that mean? What are your interests? Well, uh, my main interest is climate change adaptation yep. uh, in the agro-food sector. I work uh, mainly in uh, countries outside Europe, mainly in Africa and, and South Asia. Because we, uh, we all know that uh, there you have the people who are most vulnerable to, uh, to climate change. And uh, if we as Wageningen University, as I as a researcher, could contribute uh, decreasing their vulnerability, um, that makes me feel okay. Wonderful. So we're going to learn about nature-based solutions for climate resilient food systems. Anne-Marie, please. Uh. Okay, thank you, Rania. Uh, usually when we discuss uh, about nature-based solutions, it is in relation to coastal management or in relation to the mitigation of climate impact in cities. But talking about nature-based solutions for climate-resilient food systems, which is different from agriculture, it's much more wider, is relatively new. Let's have a look at um, a food system uh, and the food system's challenges under climate change. The most, uh, let me first say something about the food system. I already said that it's much wider than uh, only agricultural production. It uh, is a mix of activities ranging from uh, production to uh, processing consumption. It also allows us to look at socioeconomic aspects and it looks uh, at uh, the biophysical drivers that determines uh, the food systems, how it operates and its outcome. Looking at the challenges, I think the most prominent uh, challenge is the inability to feed the population. Uh, I read a recent uh, OECD um, study that mentioned that more than 800 million people in the world are undernourished. And then I come to the second inability, the inability to deliver a safe and healthy diet. The same study said that even more people are overweight or obese. The inability to equal and equitable benefits has something to do with the socioeconomic outcomes food systems generate. Think of uh, employability and income. And there is a fourth inability that is about uh, the maintenance of the uh, natural environment, the sustainability maintenance of natural environment. I don't need to tell you uh, about the uh, the huge decline in biodiversity we experience over the last decade. For nature-based nature solutions in relation to food systems, we feel it is uh, useful to distinguish between two types of nature-based solutions. There is the intrinsic type and the inspired by nature type. The intrinsic type uh, makes use of the existing ecosystem. You will hardly or just minimal uh, human activity uh, in the ecosystem. Um, the, um, the effect on biodiversity is usually more large scale, whereas looking at the inspired by nature type of nature-based solution, there you can see a much larger human involvement. Uh, it is sometimes even the creation about the creation of new ecosystems. Let's go to two examples. There is uh, one example. Uh, of we, I would like to show two examples that showcase how these nature-based solutions can help to make food systems more climate resilient. The first example is an intrinsic type of nature-based solution, which is about rainwater harvesting with the use of terraces built up by vegetative strips. And the second, more inspired type of nature-based solution is about the use of genetics to optimize natural pest control. Let's go to the first one. The intrinsic type of nature-based solution nature-based adaptation solutions, so to say. 
It's about rainwater harvesting making use of the terraces. Uh, these terraces have been developed in a rather natural way. The only intervention from the side of farmers was that they constructed soil bands and they planted grass, uh, the vegetative strips. And uh, these terraces make use of the topographic features to prevent runoff and enhance infiltration. Okay, this table uh, will show more precisely how the terraces uh, contribute to the food system challenges. And to keep in mind, specific climate change challenges uh, in this aspect is that the food security is at risk due to prolonged and more frequent droughts. Tim already mentioned it. And the reduction in the soil fertility is likely to happen due to temperature rise. So looking at the contributions, terraces do have a positive uh, contribution to food security. Because of the water infiltration, it increased water holding capacity, which leads to a reduction in yield losses. It also leads to a reduction of erosion and nutrient losses, and as such, maintain the soil fertility. In terms of safe and healthy diet, we can't say much. But there is a clear positive effect when it comes to sustainably, to sustainable environment. The vegetative strips increase biodiversity because they attract uh, insects, they attract birds, and the reduction of erosion and nutrient losses also protect the environment. I don't want to suggest that the terraces will lead to a huge increase in income. No, it is helping farmers just to overcome a drought period. It makes the system a bit more resilient. In terms of inclusiveness and equity, it's difficult to say because it largely depends the way um, the vegetative strips are being implemented. Personally, I have been involved in a similar project in Burkina Faso, and there we saw that the use of the construction of the vegetative strips was just an extra burden for the women. This is the second uh, example, which is about the use of genetics for optimizing natural pest control. It is work in progress. What we do in Wageningen is we look at two different activities. We look at the production of volatiles. As pl when plant gets attacked by a pest insect, the plant is producing volatiles. It's a kind of cry for help. And we help them to cry louder. What we also do is we look at uh, the requirements of the of the environment to host natural animals. Let's look how this measure is contributing to uh, the food system challenges. It's clearly they reduce yield losses due to reduction in pests and diseases. It increases the quality of the food because we do not need to use that much pesticides, so there is less risk of insecticide residues on the crop, and it is a reduction of the adverse effect of environment due to the less pesticide use. Uh, in terms of inclusiveness of equity, uh, it can be positive, it can be negative. You can see the reduction uh, in dependency on the chemical industry as a, a positive contribution. At the same time, you could say that uh, a dependency on uh, seed companies might be a negative uh, contribution. A few words on uh, another challenge, a different type of challenge, which is about scaling, scaling nature-based solutions. We try, in Wageningen, we try to look at scaling from a transition perspective. And we see nature-based solutions as possible transition path towards climate-resilient food systems. 
the ad advantage of using a transition perspective or a transmanagement perspective helps us to, uh, to learn more about the lock-ins and the drivers. One of the things I would like to highlight is, is the importance of belief systems. Belief systems turned out to be a very important lock-in, um, hindering uh, the uptake and scaling of uh, nature-based solutions. Um, a few words on one conclusion and the future outlook. Uh, Usually, I said already, usually when we talk about nature-based solutions in relation to food systems, we talk only about the intrinsic type. We feel that adding the inspired type uh, to the current discourse will increase opportunities to sustainably achieve climate-resilient food systems. A few recommendations for future research. Try to look at scaling. I think we f it is important to look at scaling from a transition management perspective. A last point I want to mention is about stakeholders. Uh, there is very little known about the role of stakeholders in nature-based solutions in relation to food systems. But it is good to look at who is winning and who is losing. And I think the cost effectiveness of nature-based solutions in relation to food systems is also something that needs further attention. Thank you. Thank you, Anna-Marie. Um, please uh, post any questions to uh, Anna-Marie in the chat. There are already some coming in, so uh, okay. uh, let me just begin with uh, uh, the first one. Um, and that question is, how do you see the role of cities in these food system challenges and nature-based solutions? Yeah, I think there is certainly a role of uh, nature-based solutions in, uh, in cities. Um, I think there are quite a number of examples. Maybe the next speaker will go into that. Uh, but think of, uh, of gardens, the use of gardens, the use of uh, vertical farmer, vertical farming, Depends a bit the way you implement it, but there are examples of nature-based solutions. Okay, th thank you. Um, some other um, uh, questions consider um, food. Uh, is it a distribution or a production challenge question? I think they're trying to relate it to yeah. uh, inability to feed populations, yeah. uh, waste. Where is the... Where, where I, I is it? <laughs> and what yeah, can I do? think that is a, a very interesting question. Um, but to, to be able to feed the world in, uh, also in future, it is not only an issue of um, agriculture production or food production, it's also a matter of uh, addressing the waste, the waste of food. That's one thing I would like to say about it. Uh, and on the other hand, I also have to admit, whereas, although I see quite some potentials of nature-based solutions, uh, it is not the only type of uh, food production uh, we will see in future. I think we will see, uh, let's say, a basket of uh, types of agriculture or food production. And I can see an important role for nature-based solutions in it, uh, like uh, circular agriculture Tim was talking about. Right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, there's evidence on the positive economic return of multifunctional strip cropping. What makes it difficult to have these systems adopted? Yeah, yeah that is... Um, um, well, there are different, different hindering factors. There are institutional, financial, technical, but one of the most prominent uh, hindering factor is the dominant belief systems. Mm. Farmers have been decades, you know, have been told for decades that they have to focus on money crop, money cropping and not uh, about strip cropping or mixed cropping. So that really uh, requires a change in mindset, in, in belief systems. And this may be interesting to wind up uh, in another conference, the director of SEAT was mentioning, SEAT, I hope you know SEAT, it is an important CGIR institute. He said, 
see its focus will change in the future from a focus on uh, closing the yield gap towards developing climate resilient food systems with the use of nature-based solutions. I think that's a beautiful way to end this. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Anna-Marie. Um, okay. Thank you, you're welcome. So, thank you. Uh, um, for our next speaker, we have uh, uh, Sabine de Roy. Um, please wait while I uh, try to disinfect. We don't have any disinfectant, but do we have some more disinfectant? Sorry, Sabine, please keep a distance from COVID. I'll, I'll, if, you, if you stand a bit back, I'll introduce you and someone else might be able to disinfect the table. I hope someone can. Great, coming our way. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, so, Sabine, you're, you're a landscape ecologist. Uh, yes. Tell me, what does that mean? What do you do? I research uh, the processes in, in the landscape, uh, in nature, in biodiversity, sure. and underneath the landscape. So uh, we try to understand the natural system happening yep. uh, in the landscape. Yeah, great. Thank yeah. you. I, I need someone to thank you. Yes. This one's empty, so if you can leave that here. Sorry for the apologies for that. We're, we're doing our best to cope with the COVID situation, and sometimes that uh, implies some... Uh, different logistics than we were uh, expecting. So thank you very much. Could you leave that one with me so I can do that? Excellent. Sabine, I'm sorry for that interruption, but please take it away. You're going to speak to us about nature-based solutions in urban areas. Thanks to the team. <laughs> Sabine, take it away. Thank you very much. So I will present to you some examples of how we see nature-based solutions in urban areas and how we bring them into practice. And as our minister, which should I push? Not sure. This one? Check that out. I think we're having a problem. Yes, there we go, right? Oh, there it is. Excellent. As a minister already told us in the video at the beginning of the session, climate change is posing us, our society for many challenges, and especially in urban areas. A lot of these challenges have a large impact, both financially as on the well-being of our city dwellers. And these big challenges, they ask for big changes in the way we plan and manage our urban areas. And we see this as an opportunity to do things better. Nature is multifunctional for us as society, and therefore we consider natural solutions to be better. And in some examples, I will share with you how we come up with natural solutions for climate adaptation in urban areas. Oh, yes. First example is on the outbreak of oak processionary moths. Since 1991, a new moth appeared in the south of the Netherlands, the oak processionary moth. And since then, this species has expanded to the north of our country. And from 1996 on, this moth, in fact, its larvae, started to become pests, causing a threat to public health. The poisonous hairs of the larvae of the species can cause really serious skin irritation. And as we have a lot of oaks in our Dutch urban areas, this was affecting a lot of people. So how to find a nature-based solution for this problem? And first thing to consider is why this species appeared in our country and why it could become such a plague insect. So when we look at the broader picture, climate change results in a shift of suitable climate space of species. And here you can see the shift, of the, the shift in climate space for the middle spotted woodpecker. And in the south, in the red zone, the species loses suitable climate space. And in this area, the species will disappear gradually. In the north, in the blue zone, the species gains suitable climate space and will appear when it is able to colonize habitats in this new suitable site climate space. And a similar shift in climate space is happening for the oak processionary moth. So the question is, will species be able to colonize habitats in the blue areas? Will they be able to shift their distribution area along with the shift of the suitable climate space? 
And what we see now is that opportunistic mobile species, such as the oak processionary moth, can. And this type of species appear in newly suitable habitat areas in the blue zones. However, many less mobile species do have trouble colonizing the blue area. And as a result of that, only a part of the food web can shift to the north and gets disturbed. And that is resulting in outbreaks of pests, such as the plagues of the oak processionary moth. Yeah. One nature-based solution that can help to solve this problem is to make our landscape better permeable for species. And this facilitates species to colonize newly suitable habitats in the north of the present distribution area. It helps the less mobile natural enemies to also shift to the north. And our present agricultural and urban areas are hostile environments for most species, as there is very little green infrastructure and natural environment. And these areas are barriers for species to expand to the north. And by creating more green and natural areas in and around our cities, this makes the barrier softer. And with a keen planning, our urban areas can even serve as a corridor for species. As nature is multifunctional, more nature in cities has also a lot of advantages for people too. It's cooling cities, also important for climate adaptation of urban areas, and it provides many other ecosystem services. Another nature-based solution for the outbreak of oak processionary moths can be found by taking a good look at the life cycle of the species and its place in the present food web in our country. Which species can predate on this moth and in, in any of its stadia of its life cycle? This has learned us that several common bird species are predating on the caterpillars in the nests. And further, parasitic wasps and parasitic flies put their eggs on the larvae of the oak processionary moths. And when these eggs hatch, the parasitic larvae predate on the larvae of the moths and eventually will kill them. Oops, what's the there? Yeah. An experiment that we did clearly shows that the positive effect of promoting natural enemies in the of the oak processionary moths. In the test location here, the number of nests of the moths was significantly lower than in the comparable situations. And this effect was seen in all four years of the experiment. Another challenge that we are facing as a result of climate change is to deal with increased and more intense precipitation. And here a map is shown of the city of Aden in the east of the Netherlands with the expected flooded areas after heavy rain showers in 2015. How to deal with that with nature-based solutions? And what we did was looking at the landscape the geomorphological structures that are underneath. And in the east, in the red area, we have ice push ridges where the rainwater is mainly running off on the surface to lower situated areas. And this will cause floods in the city, mainly in the dry valleys, show here in the light green. And the sloping cover sands indicated in the brown areas. And we saw a good match with the geomorphological patterns in this area and the areas where flooding was predicted. And here we see a cross-section of the same area. And understanding the geomorphological patterns helped us to explain the areas where flooding will be a problem in the future. But also, every different type of soil has its specific characteristics and plays a different role in the process of water drainage. And based on these characteristics, we could differ the ad adaptation strategies in different parts of the landscape. So in this figure, in the light blue at the bottom of the figure, the different strategies are shown. And this ranges from the utilizing the storage capacity for water in the unsaturated zone in the higher parts of the landscape, delaying the discharge to water, to delaying the discharge of water in the lower parts of the landscape to prevent droughts in drier periods in these areas. In brief, 
Urban areas are not isolated from the natural system. They are prone to the natural system. So to find solutions to cope with the climate change, we have to consider the urban areas in its wider context of the natural system. And also take the natural system underneath into account and understand the natural processes in this landscape system. And when we understand the, the natural system and the natural processes that are at work, we can work with these natural processes instead of against them when we adapt our urban areas. And in this way, nature becomes our partner in finding solutions for the adaptation to climate change. So the way that we would describe the role of nature in nature-based solutions is that nature can be a partner in finding solutions for climate change challenges when we really, really understand the system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabine. Um, wonderful. Uh, um, once again, ask uh, questions in the chat uh, for Sabine. We'll be monitoring that. Um, Sabine, just to yeah. start with, can you tell me a bit more about the costs and benefits of uh, nature-based uh, solutions? Yeah. That's quite interesting because the, the benefits of the costs are quite clear. The costs are not, uh, it's not an easy and a uh, cheap solution maybe, but it's a long-term solution and benefits are uh, for a wide range of stakeholders. It's not a, mm. a, a, a mono-purpose solution, it's a, a, a multifunctional solution. And therefore, there are many stakeholders having benefits, and altogether, it's cost-effective. However, there's not one party that uh, that is one nah, yeah, is wanting to pay the bill in a mm. lot of cases. Okay. So you have to look at the broader picture, and then it's really cost-effective. It's for the long term, also no regret. Okay. Thanks. Um, ah, some more questions are coming in. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, with regards to the problem on pests, uh, the solution is based on the effect. Should more attention be paid to the cause of the uh, problem than the uh, solution? And what do you mean by cause? Yeah, that, that well, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I think the, uh, perhaps I'm trying to read between the lines yeah. here, but uh, the, the pests are there for a reason. And uh, maybe you could elaborate a bit more about the causes and yeah. how you could work. Now, the cause is an imbalance in the, in, the, in the food web. So when there's a balance, when there are natural enemies uh, predating on these, these insects, and when there's a good balance, then there won't be a plague. But when we, when we have less biodiversity and our food web gets th thinner, tinier, mm. yeah. smaller, then uh, our system becomes more vulnerable for uh, pests uh, breakout. Right. And especially when we have this, uh, this climate change uh, and the, the shift of uh, suitable climate uh, space to the north, there are species that can move along very easily because they, have, they are very mobile, but other species have trouble and lag behind. And therefore, our food systems, our food uh, webs, become yeah, less and less uh, complex. Right. And then you get these imbalances really easy. Okay, so, so, so it's, it's, it's uh, uh, changing uh, systems, that's the cause, yeah. and then... Yeah. Okay, and so this is an adaptation, as it were, the... the and the adaptation is that we make our landscape uh, more permeable for species, so that they can move uh, along with the uh, suitable climate space. Okay, great. I'm, I'm seeing uh, uh, some, some in the chat that relating, is it uh, bad management of the environment or just plain climate change? Or maybe it's not that easy, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, the, I'm, I'm seeing one more question. Is it bad management of the environment, the cause, or climate change? Or, or oh, the, the, I it's related the to the pests again, yeah. Uh, it's, I think uh, it's a multi-cause uh, thing, because when we have a little biodiversity already and have a, 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 a poor food web instead of a rich, complex yeah. food web, then there's not, 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 not much needed to, to make a big disturbance. So, so we need to adapt. We need to adapt and we, yeah. make our, we have to make uh, our biodiversity firmer and, right. uh, yeah, and, and that is also an adaptation strategy. Yeah, w with nature as a partner, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sabine. Yeah, um, you're welcome. Thanks. Uh, I will, if you could take your cards with you. Uh, I will. Then, then we will, uh, uh, our next uh, um, section, thanks to uh, uh, the researchers for uh, uh, giving their 
talks. Um, the next section is uh, we'll move towards the panel. And while I um, try to disinfect this place here, we will welcome the panel. So, all right. So welcome. Um, um, I think it's, uh, uh, we're really happy to have, uh, uh, let's wait for a bit. There you go. Welcome. Hello. Very happy to have our panel here um, representing uh, uh, conservation, uh, sustainable finance, uh, cities, and you might recognize uh, Tim who's going to be helping uh, 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 as a sidekick for our questions. So. Uh, um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to have a little conversation one-on-one -on -one with each of you, um, and then maybe there's some room for some interaction between you, and we're going to be reserving around 10 minutes for uh, uh, interaction with the audience via chat. So please send those uh, chats up now. I think that's, uh, and Tim, uh, uh, my apologies, Tim, you are going to have to monitor those, monitor those and uh, bring that back to our panel. So welcome, I'm going to begin with uh, 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 Romy Hurika. You're from uh, the IUCN Netherlands, that's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you do? Um, and you're a senior expert green economy, it says, so that's part of the answer, what you do. But what's your personal motivation and how does that translate into your work? Great, uh, well, first of all, of course, Rainier, thank you for inviting IUCN uh, Netherlands to be part of this panel uh, today. My colleagues in Switzerland always like me to add that I work for the Netherlands Committee of uh, IUCN and I'm indeed a senior expert and I lead our work uh, with businesses and financial institutions both here in the Netherlands and globally. What inspires me to work for IUCN is that I have colleagues who are the modern day equivalents of David Attenborough and they inspire me with their work and with their experiences on the front line of nature conservation every day. So before joining IUCN, I worked for the Global Reporting Initiative uh, which develops a global standard on non-financial reporting. And there I learned that actually Impact on nature is one of the trickiest topics for companies. So I wanted to learn more. And I've been with IUCN now for seven years, and I haven't found the silver bullet yet. But I think the impact on ecosystems is very important. So if I can add a layer to the picture that Tim already uh, showed, I think there's another shockwave coming our way, which is ultimately human extinction. So when we speak with businesses, um, how long even a service company can operate without their employees having oxygen or water or food is very difficult. Lastly, as a non-biologist working for a conservation organization, I bring in an outsider's perspective and I bring in the uh, wanting to learn more about others and creating partnerships between them. Great. Thank you, th th thank you Romy. Uh, um, so what is IUCN's interest in nature-based solutions? Can you tell me a bit more about that? Well, you could say that over the 70 years of existence of IUCN as a global organization, we have been working on safeguarding nature. In the past uh, 10 years, we've made the transition to looking at the role that nature-based solutions can play in, for example, fighting global challenges as uh, climate change. And we've recently launched a nature-based solutions a standard that can be applied uh, by governments, by civil society, uh, but also by companies with the input of over 800 people in uh, over 100 countries. So that's part of our interest. As IUCN National Committee of the Netherlands, we have a lot of landscape level uh, examples of work we have done in which we have implemented nature-based solutions as part of the program. Great. Uh, um, so j just a quick question. You, you've looked at the presentations today. Can you give a few comments through your lens of a conservation organization uh, at, at the examples you've seen from uh, some of our research? Well, I think one of the key questions I had listening to some of mm. the presentations 
was the criteria of inclusiveness, which mm -hmm. is included in the nature-based solution standards. So how can you develop solutions that are not only a technical solution that's implanted, but in which also local communities have their voice heard? Because as we know, they know most about local nature, yet as they're not the power holders, they're often not involved in these processes. So I think if I'm looking at all of the presentations, that would be a key question that I would have from the conservation perspective. Inclusiveness. Inclusiveness. Okay, great. Well, um, maybe just, uh, I, I'm, I'm, my apologies, we don't have a lot of time, so we want to get to the other panels, but maybe as a last uh, um, question, uh, so who should be, you know, we're, we're interested in accelerating nature-based solutions. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts on who should be responsible or who should pick, pick it up and, uh, or should we work together? I don't know. Who is responsible for nature-based solutions, for scaling them? I think there's no single unit mm -hmm. that's responsible. So it's about finding solutions uh, together. Um, a few weeks ago, for example, Cornell University, mm -hmm. together with the Paulson Institute and the Nature Conservancy, published a research on the global biodiversity funding gap. And that funding gap is around uh, between 700 and 900 billion US dollars per year. So that's the amount that we need to reverse the current trend of biodiversity loss. And they have come up with three levels of solutions. First of all, reduce negative impact. So currently the EU is discussing about agricultural subsidies. We mm -hmm. all know that the EU Green Deal is not possible if we don't take out harmful subsidies. Then the financial sector as a second a stream needs to develop better and more green products. And we also need to invest better. For example, in the Seychelles, there has been a debt for nature swap. So foreign debt was swapped with marine protection. So I think we have to look at those type of uh, developments and solutions. Thank you so much. Sure. And you've made my uh, work very easy by transitioning to our next uh, uh, panelist. So thank you for that as well. Um, so, um, uh, Jacqueline Duiker, hello, welcome. You are uh, uh, at the uh, VBDO, in Dutch that is uh, uh, something which I won't go into, but in English, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the uh, 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 Sustainable uh, 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 or the Association of Investors for a... Uh, um, Responsible Investment. That's much easier, isn't it? Thank you for that. So that's already a great thing. Responsible Investment. Yeah. Um, Tell me, what do you do? What's your personal motivation? Yes, um, thank you, Rainier, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here in this uh, so inspiring uh, panel uh, of well, presentations, this session. Um, at the Dutch Association for Responsible Investment, where I work, um, um, what, what I can do there is, um, what I try to do there is to create um, uh, societal value by aligning um, uh, financial uh, uh, and real-world impact together. So it's by uh, bringing the financial uh, sector to the, to the positive real-world impacts. Um, and to so to achieve uh, a more sustainable world, and um, and I think it's important because uh, uh, because um, well we need to have a more sustainable world, and it's also it's not only it's not only uh, something that is nice or good to have, but it's also something that makes uh, business sense, and mm -hmm. I think that companies and uh, also uh, investors uh, can only uh, continue to exist if we have a more sustainable uh, world. So it's a necessity. That, that, that's also inspiring. And, and if you were to put on your lens uh, uh, of uh, uh, representing sustainable investors, right? Yes. We've seen some examples of nature-based solutions, um, but we've also seen the need to scale them. Yes. And, and finance is a part of that. Yes. What is, and, and yet uh, uh, Romy has highlighted, I think the 700, is it billion gap? Billion. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, what is needed to, to mobilize <laughs> that finance? That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a, an, an interesting question, but not, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> not a one simple answer. Um, so, um, what is there's many things that are needed. Um, so, uh, for for uh, to do that, I think um, maybe to give a little background within uh, um, uh, our organization, uh, we work. We've been working now for 15 years to. Um, to push the financial sector to uh, to um, to invest more responsible, um, and um, that's um, and, and so we've seen uh, how difficult it is to to develop that. 
Um, and what we do also is that we uh, are a multi-stakeholder organization and we work together with uh, many different types of stakeholders. So, uh, of course, investors and companies, um, but also uh, NGOs, uh, labor unions, governments. It's very much multi-stakeholder. We try to bring that together and that's not easy, but I think that is important and it's an important uh, part of also a way to, to proceed is that we need to... Uh, all uh, work together more to do that. And also something else that was already um, uh, mentioned in the presentation of uh, Anne-Marie on the food systems, uh, I think. She mentioned uh, the word belief system, that the farmers had to adjust their belief systems. And I think that all the stakeholders I just mentioned also need to uh, change part of the belief system in which they work. That's also true for the financial sector. Um, they are very much focused uh, on uh, risk returns and uh, trying to include now uh, more uh, societal impacts. Um, but that's not easy and it requires a different approach to how the decisions are made. And I think we need much more um, uh, development on that. And I also believe that, uh, well, uh, initiatives like this can, uh, like nature-based solutions, they can also, yeah, be very helpful to that. So if we can um, make the impacts more specific in terms of impact indicators, in terms of sustainable development goals, then uh, it would be easier also that would help the financial sector in the decision making to finance. So that's another thing. And there's, there's a few more, I guess. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I, I'm sure there are a few more. Thank you. Just, just a quick question before we move to Sasha. Um, yeah. um, I asked uh, Romy about who should be responsible for scaling nature-based solutions. Would I be correct in, in, in also ascertaining from your uh, answer, uh, uh, we all are? I believe so, we all are. And it, that's also mentioned uh, in one of the presentations that the, uh, the costs are relatively easy to, uh, to identify, but, but the benefits are very much fragmented. So uh, we need someone to take ownership of those benefits, and then from there, um, uh, yeah, we can work together. In there, yeah, there's, there's many, there's many uh, beneficiaries. So uh, yeah, it's, it, the cooperation is required. And that's also maybe changing belief Great. systems. Yeah. All right, let's yeah. find those solutions together. Um, thank you. Sasha, Sasha Stolp, you are, uh, let me read it, the Director Innovation of the Future Proof Assets Program of the City of Amsterdam. That sounds Correct. very exciting. Uh, what do you do? It is. Yeah, and what's your what motivation? Do do? Well, okay. Uh, well, thank you first for all being here, and of course, welcome in our city of Amsterdam. And, um, well, let's start with my personal motivation, because besides that I'm a professional, I'm already also a mother, I do have children, and I want to have them, they're born in Amsterdam, raised in Amsterdam, I want to have them as many chances as I have had born and raised here too. I think this is one of the severe things that climate change uh, is coming over our city, and it will cost us, it will cost us not only the lifespan of our assets, and that's why we have to reconsider future-proof assets. And, but it is also the health and the happiness of the people living here. And climate change is, in fact, a disaster. And we do have, and we have heard all many kinds of fiercely attractive solutions today based on nature. But how are we making this part of our system in the city? I think this is the breakthrough that we are looking for. And... And of course, this kind of breakthrough goes with the new return on investment. And that's not a return on investment only in profit, but it's in, in people, in planet. And also in sharing an inspirational story together with each other. Because I do think that the city will never become a forest. We have other benefits here. And usually our citizens are here because they are not a farmer. And but they are quite a large buyer of products. They do buy food every day usually, and, uh, and we do buy all kinds of products which we use in our public space. Can we change the role of us being launching customer? I think that's, that's an essential part of uh, future-proof assets, and therefore finding the new regulations and standards that we need as a city to become resilient and, of course, very prospective. Great. Well, I've just heard that IOCN has published some standards, so uh, there you go. Uh, maybe that's a help. But maybe a, a, um, a question. Uh, um, 
when you look through the presentations and maybe some of the contributions through your lens, right, uh, from the city of Amsterdam, um, what, what do you see specifically? How, 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 how does this, how have you seen these presentations? Well, I, I see them in an integrated perspective and then apply them on the city that we already are. Because it sometimes looks like that we're going to build this city completely new, but that won't be true, and I hope it won't be true. Yeah. We, we invest, of course, a lot every day, but we are here already, and we have to make the next step to become this resilient city. What I said, uh, mentioned before, uh, nature-based solutions are very interesting, but look at them as nature-based solutions and also technique which we can apply, which is based on nature like having balance in our water management system mm. and our micro uh, uh, systems here in the city and, and see it from this perspective too. So it won't, well, well, as I mentioned, we won't have a forest here because we want to have it accessible, we want to have roads and pavements too. We want to have much more buildings because people are moving to cities. But can we apply these very fiercely attractive uh, uh, nature-based solutions mm -hmm. to the assignment of the city. And I think this will be the, the thing that we we'll have to solve for the coming next years, and not only as a city, but also together with knowledge institutes and a knowledge agenda. Great. I, I think before we go to the questions, just one last question yeah. for you. So how are you implementing nature-based solutions in the city? Are you, are you st uh, I, I understand you are starting with living labs and uh, yes. uh, scaling up. How, how are you doing that? Well, what we're doing is from what this is triple helix yeah. perspective, we look not only at, uh, from us as a launching customer, from uh, the Knowledge Institute and what companies has to offer right now already, but which we aren't using as a standard. Let's say, for instance, we're now uh, running a pilot project, a living laboratory project with uh, turf sport pitches. And we are looking, can we make these turf sport pitches function like natural ecosystems? Because right now, those things get very hot in summertime, and you can't even play on that, and it's not healthy for the environment. But are there solutions in which we can provide this, uh, um, this turf sport pitches with the natural cooling? Well, we figured out we can, and we do have pilot projects right now here nearby, on the other end of the water at the Marine Square, and we're now going to upscale this system together with our National Football Association, <laughs> to five whole fields, and then again, if this works and it becomes a new standard, we have to replace 20,000 turf sport pitches in Europe. So then we can help other European cities too, by starting here and then making it large. A, a real challenge. Yes, uh, a uh, challenge. We'll look yes. forward to, to seeing how that develops. Thank you very much, Sasha. Um, Tim. Yes. Are there any questions? Of course, yeah. We Good. Received some very interesting questions. Um, maybe to start with one. Um, uh, the, the question is, how do we think uh, that COVID-19 influences the discussion on uh, implementation of nature-based solutions in maybe a positive way or a negative way? Because there's a more need for green space, but uh, maybe also in a negative way. So, so I've heard green space. Maybe that's a, a, a question first to, uh, 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 to Sasha, but then maybe also if Jacqueline or Romy want to yeah. uh, please chime in. <laughs> well, I think it's very important because we saw an increased use of the green space in the urban area because people are not only living and, and working here, but they also want to go outside and have some fun. And so the stretch on, on the uh, green areas was very severe. And what you see right now is that in combination with the uh, economic uh, impulse program, we have also selected that we wanted to have more green space in the city and see this as an uh, economic impulse measurement. Yeah. Okay, great. Tim, any more questions for anyone yeah, else? Or, or Romy, yeah, please. Um, so I think my reflection is, first of all, there is this myth that uh, COVID-19 is helping nature conservation. You know, you see dolphins in, in Venice, 
but that's very much not true. What we see is that the people working in the front line of conservation are struggling more today than ever before because there is a level of lawlessness which is impa mm. impacting uh, nature a lot. I think if you look at uh, the city's uh, level, we look a lot at uh, sustainable use. And then if you look at sustainable use, that means that you have to look at the city at maybe a wider scale. So we've been active in, in Ghana for a long time, where we work, uh, among others, in Atiwa, uh, which is a forest reserve uh, near Accra, where five million people uh, live, and they all rely for their water on this um, uh, forest reserve and the rivers that flow from the forest reserve. And what we see, for example, is that that forest reserve is impacted by bauxite mining. Uh, okay. So I think look at a bigger scale also to find sustainable use solution. Okay, Jacqueline, maybe, or um, well, um, or do we want to chime on, in? What um, do you want? <laughs> yes, maybe uh, on COVID-19. Um, I think, uh, well, uh, one of the causes is, of course, uh, that the ecological imbalance that's now ongoing, uh, that we, uh, that, that's one of the things that, that causes viruses like this to become more apparent. So I think that's an important one. And I also struck me, it was the, one of the sheets that Tim uh, showed in the beginning of the three waves that hit us. And um, so then the COVID-19 is a, is, a, is a huge one that we are now all very uh, busy with. But uh, the larger one, uh, the climate change is uh, much larger and coming. It's further away. Yeah. So the urgency is maybe not uh, felt as much, but it's much bigger and the impacts will be much, much more. And I think we need to realize that and uh, yeah, keep at that track as well. Okay. Thanks. Tim, um, any more? <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, Let's one very interesting question uh, um, related to the vision we showed about uh, the nature-based future for the Netherlands. Um, and the question is, um, every square meter in the Netherlands is planned. Um, so if you want to turn, for instance, agricultural land into a wetland or a forest or whatever, um, how are we going to do that? And what does it mean for the value of the land, for instance? Well, how, how are we going to organize that? Who is responsible? I hear value, and that might be Jacqueline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, well, uh, um, how, how are we going to do it exactly? I, who is responsible? We are, we are all responsible. Uh, but how are we responsible? We have to... Uh, uh, I think it's important that we see uh, that we also have share a common interest here. So it's not about, uh, uh, you know, we are, we, are, we are fighting each other in interest. There is a, there's a, there's a common interest uh, and, and we should find, uh, and from there we should, um, we, we can find uh, the ways to, 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 to address it as well. Because it's about the livability of our country, it's in everyone's interest. And if we don't have a livable country anymore, the value is zero or even less anyway. So we can only gain by doing these things. And of course, it's not easy and it's complex and there's many interests involved in the short term, but there's a longer term fundamental overall interest. And that's, the, that's, that's what we should navigate on, I think. Great. Maybe one more short one before we round up. Uh, Tim, is that, uh, you think that's possible? Well, maybe in general, what's the, what's the role of um, knowledge? in nature-based solutions. Uh, do, we, do, we still, do we know enough about nature-based solutions to start implementing on a, on a big scale? Or, or do we still need to uh, create more evidence base about these? So, so why don't yeah. we do that uh, as, as, a, as a conclusion then? What's the role of knowledge? And maybe also look at uh, how Wageningen might support you. Uh, um, and uh, maybe just start quickly with uh, yeah. Sasha, and then we'll go this way. Well, as I mentioned before, if you work in the triple helix partner you'll, you, uh, or process, you have to look to the benefit for all those three partners. And of course, a knowledge institute is there on earth to gain knowledge and to send knowledge. We as a city, we need applied science actually to create our new standards, policies and legislations. And on the third side, for the companies, we have to create this new kind of business model. And it's not that we have to help them to create a business model, but as a big owner, and because with our uh, citizens, we are a very large buyer. Can we change our question? Helped by policies, helped by legislation, but also by, well, let's say an internal movement well, inside the society. 
Changing the question will mean that we will have this broader perspective and new All business right. questions. Changing the question, new business models, over to Jacqueline. Quickly. Yes, um, okay, um, I think well, the urgency is very clear and knowledge is vital, of course, to, to, to create solutions and that's exactly what you are doing and in, in, in many different ways as you just showed. So this is what you need, with what you do with the knowledge, create the solution and then you have to move on to the next step and, and realize them and you have to indeed uh, maybe make business cases, work together with other partners, identify impact case indicators. So, yeah, uh, find out what the other stakeholders um, yeah, need to work with you together. Great. Other stakeholders, Romy? A Quick scientific one. organization, of course, science for us is key, but I think also we don't need more research, but also the, the willingness and the ability to fail and to experiment. I think that's very important. Great. I think that's a wonder wonderful way to end as well. Uh, the willingness to fail is also part of learning, and I think learning is essential for this. Um, so I think that the, one of the conclusions, we do need to find nature-based solutions together um, to move to a climate resilient and uh, biodiversity inclusive society. So uh, these conversations are very important to us. Thank you to uh, all the panelists, uh, to all the uh, researchers uh, who've given there, and to all the people in the, in the background helping us out here. So thank you very much. I've had a very interesting uh, uh, one and a half hours. And thank you to you, our audience. Um, please do keep in touch if you uh, will share a uh, slide with addresses, uh, email addresses. So if you have any other questions, please do continue the dialogue. So um, I can only conclude, see you at the Climate Adaptation Summit, January 25, 2021. Thank you very much.